Vision TV. Reverend Majid El Shafi always wakes up to the same stark reminder. An Egyptian interrogator carved out this cross on his back. They tortured Majid for being a Christian activist in Egypt. The officer that tortured me, they don't call each other by names. They call each other by numbers. Officer number 27, he came, he said, you tell me the name of your friends, I said no. And he bring an Egyptian life called mangal, is what they use to cut the grass. And they make cut in the back of my left shoulder to the bones, and they put salt and lemon in the open wounds. There is always a military doctor standing behind you. This military doctor, his mission not to stop the pain or to heal your wounds, his mission to make sure that you are conscious to the pain. The last stage of, of the torture, they took me to another dark room. There was a piece of wooden cross shape. And um, uh, they took off my clothes and they crucified me for two days and a half. And uh, I knew it was two days and a half because every day, in the past of every day, they would come with a hose, a water hose, and they clean you like an animal, really, as you are standing. What I know that their scars is my scars. Their pain is my pain. Their experience is my experience. They are my people. And I will not leave them behind. I was born from a wonderful Muslim family back home in Egypt. My father was a lawyer, my brother is a lawyer. In the first year in the law school in Alexandria, the persecution that I found that happening to the Christian minority in Egypt shocked me to the core. I started to study the Bible, I started to know more. Christianity is not about religion. Christianity is about relationship with God. I want to believe in Christ. I accept Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. Why were you arrested? Why did the Egyptian government torture you? We started a human rights organization in Egypt, underground human rights organization. We built churches inside caves, inside mountains, because according to the Egyptian law, you cannot build churches. You cannot even fix the old churches. Fearing for his life in Egypt, El Shafi managed to escape the country and then he received religious asylum in Canada eight years ago. Majid now operates One Free World International, a human rights organization based out of Toronto. El Shafi dedicates much of his life to help persecuted Christians in the Middle East and Asia. And he has enemies. We just have to have security around us, going and coming, especially in public places. I think there is one fatwa from Egypt and another fatwa from Al-Qaeda organization uh, that uh, they want to kill me or something. And I think in Pakistan right now, I received some information as well that they want, me, they want to hunt me down there. We have bodyguards, we have bulletproof vests and so on. Nobody knows when I come and when I leave. I believe that God will protect me, and when it's my time to go, it's my time to go. Majid is on his way to check up on Rami Atiyah, an Egyptian still traumatized from being tortured. This program is brought to you by Idea City. Idea. Rami and his wife Christine are Egyptians. They were full of optimism when they married. They had wealth, a thriving business, a future, and later children. But that vanished when Egyptian security, the SSI, summoned Rami for interrogation in June 2008. Christine's father was a Christian activist, and they wanted to punish the family.
basically some of it cigarettes and uh, some of it is a special machine, very hot metal and they just burn the back with it. 32 times. And this is what they do for innocent people just because they believe. You wouldn't do this to an animal, but they did this to a human being. When you are tortured to some steps, high steps, you feel that we are sleeping. I feel this sleeping. I can't bear this tortured. In this time, I see the picture of Jesus in front of my eyes. After torturing him, they threw him on the floor outside in the street. Uh, two guys find him and they bring him at home in a very, very bad condition. At the time, Christine was pregnant with her second child. Egyptian police threatened her that if Christine's father does not turn himself in, she will be tortured as well. Majid's team then persuaded Canadian authorities to issue emergency visas. Rami and Christine fled and left everything behind. But when they arrived in Toronto, it was clear the damage was already done. I wish that you were there when we saw Rami in the beginning, when he was landed in, in the Toronto airport. He was hallucinating. He was hitting his head on the wall. He went to mental hospital in the beginning. I couldn't believe how you can destroy a man's soul to this degree. Until now, he had very deep depression. He takes 17 kind of medication, something like that. He still wake up in the middle of the night screaming. Rami, Christine, and their children are now safe in Toronto. But Rami cannot escape his torture chamber and the pain. Rami finds some solace in prayer, but for the most part, he is lost in his new country. He lost his prosperous plastics business, his wealth, his status in Egyptian society. His dignity is destroyed. When we are at the lowest of our lows, and everything is closing in, and nothing is going right, and we think that God couldn't possibly see us. Why are you doing something about what I'm going through? And I think the answer is this. We don't see all that he sees. The God of the universe knows your name, and he cares about you. He loves you. It's no place that bad be. No Majid Al Shafi knows how lonely that can be, alone in a torture cell, alone with no hope. I'm underground, believing, and that's when I start to pray. Day number two, they hang me upside down. They burn me with cigarettes. They took the nails off my toes. They slashed me. Yeah. They, in the second day, um, the only thing that I can really remember was the taste and the smell of my blood. So I told him, Lord, just do me a favor, because you know that I'm flesh and blood. Kill me before tomorrow morning. Now Chantal Deloge works with him to help others who suffered like Majid. She's a successful immigration lawyer. Rami and Christine come to see Chantal. We take the more comfortable chairs. <laughs> she and Majid had arranged for them a temporary emergency visa. Chantal is working free of charge to help make their residency permanent. Thanks. So how are you guys holding up? Are you still looking for work? Did you find anything yet? Uh, Rami was working in this vision. I sent you maybe and told you about I it. I think you did mention to me, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are you still, or it was just a short term? He stopped working there because uh, he is not able. I have depression. 
right. and they give me medication, make me all the time sleeping tired. They do. They make you very sleepy. Yeah. I know. Yeah. So it's hard for you to work. Yeah. Okay. We tried really. Those types of cases, honestly, it's anyone's prediction how long it will take. I'm kind of hoping that over time, as he continues with his treatment, he might be able to become a little bit more self-supporting. I'm hoping that as the kids get a little bit older, maybe his wife can be a little bit more self-supporting. But in the end, it's going to come down to the officer weighing the pluses and the minuses in the case. In a way, you're lucky that you guys are here now. You know, there are a lot of people having the same situation living back in Egypt, and they have no way to come to Canada. Thanks for God first, and thanks for you second. Yes, yes. <laughs> God's not finished with you yet. Yeah. He wouldn't save you out of all that for no reason. Yes. yes. I consider what I do not just to be an occupation, it's a vocation. Uh, for me, that's something that means it's a higher calling for me. And my work is very much my ministry. Coptic Christians gather for a feast in Shubra, a Cairo suburb. It's believed the Apostle St. Mark introduced Christianity to Egypt shortly after Christ's crucifixion. There's an estimated 9 to 12 million Christians in Egypt, roughly 10% of the population. During the 30-year presidency of Hosni Mubarak, Christians were gradually forced out of government and military positions. Coptic Christians were allowed to thrive in business so long as they didn't meddle in politics. Lekin, uh, the Muslims were already becoming entrenched in high positions in the state, and they made sure to marginalize the Christians. In the Egyptian government, there were only one or two Christian ministers, and among the governors, there were none, eventually just one. And right now, there is no one. If Christians pushed their case too far, they would face torture and imprisonment like Majid al-Shafi and Rami Atiyah. Parishioners like Gamil Iskander say they feel prejudice, especially in the workplace. Of course we feel second class. We live in a country where the citizens are supposed to have rights. But we don't. As a Coptic Christian, we feel we don't have rights. We feel the persecution. If there is a problem, we don't feel supported. At every Cairo church, there's a police checkpoint, partially to monitor who goes in and out, and partially to protect. There are no such checkpoints in front of most of the Cairo mosques. Christian Mona Makram Abed is a former parliamentarian. Many Christians say that during President Mubarak's time, they felt like second-class citizens. Do you think it's true? I ran myself last time in 2010. I made it, and they removed me the next day. The president wanted to make cops feel that they are under his protection, you know. He gives them a seat. They don't win a seat. They don't run for election. They are appointed by him and they owe their loyalty to him. The ruined headquarters of the former National Ruling Party stands in testament to the demise of the Mubarak dictatorship. The old system has been destroyed. The big political changes in Egypt have created a lot of hope and a lot of concern. For Christian cops, they hope that they'll have a more equal standing than they did under the regime of President Mubarak. But there's also concern, concern about more radical Islamic parties that might jeopardize their standing in Egyptian society. And with the end of Mubarak's secular dictatorship, Muslim fundamentalists have significantly increased their political power. Hardline Salafists, for example, demand the release of a cleric who inspired the first bombing of New York's World Trade Center. He's serving a life sentence in the United States. The conservative Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafists are dominating Egypt's newfound democratic power. Many Coptic Christians perceive this as a serious threat to their community. And they consider us apostates and heretics, not faithful. Not faithful. 
والكافر من وجهه نظرهم يحل دمه. And the unfaithful could be killed. They want to kill him. This bombing of the All Saints Church in Alexandria enhanced the cops' worst fears. This amateur video captured the carnage seconds after the blast killed 21 worshippers. And security forces killed 25 Christian protesters demonstrating against the partial demolition of an Aswan church. The Muslim Brotherhood is the dominant political party in Egypt. The Brotherhood spokesperson says the Christians were not the only ones who suffered from the Mubarak dictatorship. 45,000 Muslim Brotherhood members were arrested without cause. I was imprisoned five years. Without any reason I suffered from this regime. The Muslims suffered from this regime much more than the Christians. Christians suffered a lot in the past from clashes with Muslim groups here, especially in recent years. And they're worried this will continue. What would you like to tell them? I will tell the Christians there is no cause for their concern. There is no difference between us. We are all one entity. We are all Egyptian citizens. They can give Christians and Muslims promises and have pacts. But when they are governing, they will act differently. To thwart the threat of a radical Islamic takeover of Egypt, Christian political activists like Mona Makram Abed want the evolving parliament to formulate a Bill of Rights that would ensure civil rights for all, regardless of religious affiliation. This is what we're fighting for now, is to have a general consensus that will accept this Bill of Rights. Now, even if the Islamic uh, tendency or the political Islam takes a majority, it doesn't matter if it's true democracy and we have this guarantee of rights that nobody can deviate from, then we can go ahead. Many of the Coptic Egyptians who live abroad, that live in Canada, are really concerned. What do you tell them? I tell them, give it time. This is a revolution. It's not just a tea party. There are people in Egypt committed to have a democratic, civilian, modern state. And I think that they will make it. We'll be, in, as well, inviting some of the Pakistani communities. Majid al Shafi is on his way to meet with the Daniel family from Pakistan. Egypt is just one front in his struggle to help persecuted Christians. <laughs> Dani Ram Daniel and his daughters Tahir and Shireen owe much to Reverend El Shafi. Do you still have nightmares in the night about your incident? Daniel was kidnapped for a short while by Muslim extremists who tried to convert him to Islam. They also attempted to kidnap the daughters, but they escaped. And uh, she started beating that guy and he, he was unable to make a hold on her. What did the family managed to flee to Canada and applied for refugee status. Convert to Islam or otherwise we make your life hell. Mm. Oh. Canadian immigration authorities denied them the visa and ordered them deported. Majid helped them to hide illegally while he and Chantal petitioned their case in the courts. I'm not talking about criminals. I'm not talking about people that they are causing any harm to the society. I'm talking about people like me and you they are facing persecution because their beliefs at home. So yes, I do cross the legal line as long as it's peaceful and not violent and not causing harm to anyone. Like, so do you want him to come to live yes. here with you? Yes. After 18 months of hiding, they were finally granted refugee status. The challenge is now to bring out Dani Ram's son, Harun, and his wife. Mm -hmm. The problem was with the situation of your brother. Like Rami Atia, he's facing the repercussions of his family fleeing Pakistan. What he's hiding from? Like what's happening to him right now? Uh, because uh, some Muslim uh, extremists, they want to kill him and they are looking for him. And uh, uh, some of his friends, they told him not to come back home. Mm. And All of this because his father, because his religion, because he's a Christian, for what reason? Yeah. Uh, yeah, because uh, because of his Christian and he mm. won, uh, won him to convert to Islam. To Islam, and he refused to convert yes. to Islam. Mm. So, tell me, how many years you did not see him? You know? uh, seven years. Seven years. Yes. Do you miss your brother? Yeah. 
Do you, do you miss your son? Do you miss him? He wants him to come right now. He is praying every day, day and night, that uh, he bring my brother here. Mm -hmm. Well, I promise you, as we work in your case and everything will be fine, your son will be in your arms very soon. You have my word on that. Okay. No problem. After visiting the Daniels, Majid presses his case in the media. He's going to be interviewed on Toronto Sun Television to discuss how rape is used as a persecution weapon in the Middle East. Joining us now is human rights activist and lawyer Majid Al Shafi, who has spoken directly with some of the victims. Thanks for joining us, Majid. I appreciate it very much. It's a pleasure being here with you. In, in Majid describes several cases documented by his organization. We spoke about we, we three, four victims there. One of them that was a daughter actually was raped in front of her mom. And uh, they kept the mom in the kitchen. They closed the door and she can hear her daughter from outside the door basically getting raped. The another victim that we spoke with was, was a wife that when her husband came, she asked from her husband to shoot her. Anoush and her family know the devastation of rape. They pray with Reverend Al Shafi to forgive the three men that raped her in her Baghdad home back in Iraq. The rapist said it was her punishment for being a Christian traitor working at the British Embassy. Anoush had a low-paying job as domestic staff. Following the rape, Anoush and her family received refugee asylum in Canada. It's now been seven years, but she is still traumatized. I was destroyed. I am destroyed. Honor is the most important thing for us. I have a husband and children. I felt humiliated in front of my family, but I couldn't do anything. I was tied up. My husband was devastated, devastated. And now it has been so many years. Until now, I still can't get close to my husband. I have fears. I am terrified. I just can't get close to him. He understands my position. I am seeing a psychiatrist, and they give me pills. My depression, but until now, inside of me, I cannot forget. Anusha's three children and nephews come for dinner. <laughs> They're happy in Canada, but they all carry within them the sadness of their mother's rape. They rape and they steal, and then after that, they kill. I don't think there is any like a future for Christian people over there. Ever since the American invasion, half the Iraqi Christian population has fled the country. Anusha's sister Marian also lives in Canada with her sons. Several years ago, several men broke into her Baghdad home and seriously beat up her husband. He died of a stroke a month later. Yan Obadashian is her son. They kill uh, priests, attack church, attack uh, Christian family's home. The Christian girl, she cannot go outside. If she go outside, they kidnap her and rape her. In their mind, first I will rape her, after that I will force her to marry me. Like she turned to become Muslim. In some areas, they force the Christian there. You be Muslim, I will kill you. What's missing is Anusha's and Marianne's sister. She still lives in Baghdad with her family. I am afraid they will go into the house and kill them, like what they did with us. They came in and threatened us, and my husband died. Sam, action! The smile's back. Goldfish. The guy's good. <laughs>
once it's accepted, they can come from Iraq. Majid and Chantal are trying to help Anoush bring her sister and her family to Canada. I want to bring the family for you. Well, we can, we can probably do it as a humanitarian application then. How much did this case cost? Mm, you're probably looking around 7,000, 7,500. Oh, oh, I don't think that the family have anything. Mm. So what I will do is that I will try to find church sponsors mm -hmm. for the operation. Like the family already faced enough challenges. Mm -hmm. I want to end the misery of this family just to know that I ended their misery, mm -hmm. the pain that they are facing. Well, I mean, it, it can definitely be done. Mm -hmm. um, there are legal ways to do it. The question is the timing. If we make it clear that there is some risk to the female, mm. uh, they might even be willing to try to expedite it. But how, how, how long this will take, though? Time is the essence. It'll probably be about a year. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I know that Jason heard her story. It wasn't a conference, and he heard her speaking, mm. and he was in tears. I know that. Resettled Jason back. Kenney is Canada's immigration minister. Uh, they're living in sometimes. Canada accepts forward. more Iraqi refugees per capita than any other country in the world. And elsewhere. Why does Canada take in so many Iraqi refugees? In many cases, people whose churches have been destroyed, whose daughters have been violated, whose priests have been beheaded, and not just Christians, of course, people from other communities who feel that it is impossible for them to resettle back in, in Iraq. Canada uh, has to do its part. Um, and moreover, this is a group of refugees who are blending into Canadian society quickly and successfully. Arranging safe sanctuary for persecuted Christians in Canada can take years, but there are success stories. Okay. Do me a favor, can you just keep, keep looking just if you saw him? Majid has brought Dani Ram Daniel to the airport. His son Haroon is arriving with his wife. <laughs> Slowly, slowly. Slowly, slowly, yes. <laughs> Are you excited? Yeah, of course. The people that are coming out right now, okay. they are from the same flight, so that means we're getting closer. We'll be arriving and he will be in your arms again. Seven years? Been seven years? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. There are countless cases like Harun, Anoush, and Rami throughout the Middle East and Asia. Harun will always carry within him the scars of his ordeal. Muslim assailants tried to literally cut out his tattooed cross on his arm. They dug so deep in some places, he could easily have died. It's the same scar. It's the same scar that they are on my body. It's the same scar that they are on Harun body. It's made with the same knife, the same uh, hatred, the same ignorance. No matter what the names, what the difference of the names, and no matter what the difference of the color, they are the same scars. 
Harun now has a chance to build a life with his wife. With the Daniel chapter closed, Majid is preparing for his next challenge. He's just been given word from the Iraqi embassy that he can bring a delegation to Baghdad to press his case for Iraqi Christians. In secondary prizes. Go to visiontv.ca for more details. Our Father who are in heaven. One of the reasons Majid is flying to Baghdad is to find out what happened to this woman, Raja Shara. Her studio apartment in Toronto isn't in any way remarkable, not for a religious middle aged woman. On her nightstand, there's a photograph, some rosary beads, and a crucifix. But there's another item there that catches the eye. It's a bullet, a reminder of the attack on a Baghdad church that left her wounded and killed the young woman in the photo, her 22-year-old niece, Ragda. And then uh, the terrorists uh, come, uh, enter the church, and they lock the door. And uh, after they kill, they kill every, everyone, even the youth. An eyewitness caught this mayhem at a Baghdad hospital following the attack. 47 people died and scores were wounded after five gunmen stormed Our Lady of Deliverance Catholic Church in the Iraqi capital in October 2010. Many thousands of Iraqi Christians packed up and left after the massacre. She was my life, says Raja. I only pray for my niece, she says. The Vatican airlifted Raja and other wounded to Rome for treatment. She had a personal audience with the Pope. Several weeks later, the Vatican arranged for her a religious asylum visa in Canada. She has now joined other Iraqi Christian exiles trying to pick up the pieces of their lives. Establishing their community churches like this Chaldean Catholic congregation in Toronto. It's Raja's suffering and thousands like her that has compelled Majid to organize a delegation to Iraq. Joining us are parliamentarian John Weston, senator as well as clergyman Don Meredith, and Iraqi Canadian community leader Rabia Alos. Majid's bringing them to open the doors to high ranking Iraqi politicians. So how do I feel about going there after all of these years? Part of me uh, worried, part of me is careful. It's also bringing all the sad memory, all of this injustice, the prisons, the corruption, bring all the bad memories, what I went through back home in Egypt. Every time you help others, you help yourself. Every time you see the smile of a child that you help, or a woman that you saved, or a man that you secure that life, it does help. It does help them, it does help me change that life and change my life. We would never be the same again. Hi, Reverend Majid, you're at the head of the Hello, sir. Hi, pleasure Mike. meeting you. Thank you, Mike. Charlie, it's great. I'll take you down to the great zone. Once in Iraq, we are confronted by the persistent danger. Today, Baghdad is guarded by the Iraqi military. Coalition forces are gone, so we need bodyguards. Absolutely. I mean, we've uh, taken all the precautions that are necessary to protect ourselves uh, to support um, Majid and his initiative here to ensure that we're speaking out for those who do not have a voice in this uh, area of uh, the world. The reminders of Saddam Hussein's totalitarian regime still looms over Baghdad. This is the monument to glorify the war with Iran that claimed nearly a half a million lives. When the Americans deposed the Iraqi leader, it created a power vacuum, which is still unresolved. In many ways, Iraq is a test case for Arab democracy. So far, the score is mixed. Sectarian strife and corruption are still big problems. How minorities like the Christians will be treated will in many ways give an indication if democracy can take root in this country. 
The new Iraqi parliament is meant to personify the unity of Shiite Muslims, Sunni Muslims, Kurds, and Christians, united in a democratic Iraq. This is where the MP was. The MP yeah. was yeah. That's his seat. Place, yeah. This is yeah. his seat. Yeah. But that democracy is constantly attacked by militants who want to destroy it. So far, 12 parliamentarians have been assassinated. Anyone who is part from the parliament or the Iraqi government is target from uh, mm -hmm. the terrorists. As a new Iraqi lawmakers tell Majid's delegation that all the Iraqi ethnic groups suffer from terrorism and bloodshed. Very well protected. The problem is not only Christian. You know, the terrorists every day they kill. Now they kill. They don't kill a Christian. They kill medical doctors. Mm -hmm. So medical doctors who are Christian, they don't make difference yet. Anyone who is a very good specialized, they kill him. Mm -hmm. Or they kidnap him and they ask for That's money. Yeah. And then uh, they kill him. After you give them money, also they kill him. Mm -hmm. So it's not a question of, uh, I think, from our experience, a Christian or Muslim or Shia, there is a group of people, they don't want Iraq to be stabilized. It is important that those freedoms are realized. Once those freedoms, then the, you have the support of Canadians, you have the support of the international community. Our bodyguards give us the green light to travel to Our Lady of Deliverance Church tomorrow. That means we have to go through a mandatory crash course in escaping ambushes. If gunmen destroy a vehicle, everyone has to be instantly crammed into the back seat of an escape car under fire. We make our way to Our Lady of Deliverance Church, where Raja was wounded and her niece Ragda killed. The security is very tight right now in the city. We already hear about some attacks, and uh, we still when going out for our mission, well, right now outside the green zone, so we are outside the safe zone, going to the red zone to see the church. We are right now more or less a target. As we travel there, a lead car sends out signals to jam the possible detonation of any roadside bombs. The priests warmly greet us. They are the lucky ones. Two other priests were killed in the attack. And today, just serving their congregation is a dangerous business. They show the delegation where five gunmen, whom they suspect were Sunni al-Qaeda, stormed into the church, firing on the worshippers and throwing hand grenades. This is the spot where Raja Shara was wounded and fell among the dead. A priest says the blast was so powerful that body parts became stuck in the chandeliers. This is part of the bomber, the suicide bomber. It's part of his body. Raja's niece Ragda was a few months pregnant. She hid with the other frightened worshippers in the sacristy, where the priests donned their robes. This is what the last thing that she did, that she put her hand on the wall and this is it, her actual blood. Inside. According to Father Karam, Ragda spoke her last words to her unborn child here. Throughout the four hour incident, the priests tell us that Iraqi security forces stood outside and did nothing. He was the, the sniper. He was, was standing here. The military said they did their best to stop the attack. According to the priests, only after the terrorists blew themselves up did Iraqi security forces storm the church. And then the priests claim police stole jewelry and mobile phones from the dead and wounded. The authority entered and they found the, the young lady here and they took her cell phone and her jewelry from here. This is the police. This is the authority. Did, did you hear anything about this? Yeah. One, one of the two Iraqi, Iraqi police, what, what, what he says, he says to the, to the, to the guards, uh, I put uh, my magazine out and I put uh, in the place of my magazine, I put the, the, the gold and the mobiles of the victims. Okay, uh, excuse me, uh, can, can I just ask you a question? As an MP, as a member of parliament, how, how did you react to this knowing that this is happening to your people? Our police and military, I, I'm sorry to say that, it was built in very bad 
uh, I can say, process, and there was a, a very bad infiltration inside army or police or everything, mm. all the security forces. And till now, we are suffering from not only thieves, but some uh, mm. spies, some criminals. Mm. Uh, there was investigation there on them. investigation taking place right it's now. It's a big lie. They can uh, catch the, the terrorists and put them in the prisons. We cannot mm. believe that. The Canadian delegation wants answers for victims like Ragda. Her tomb stands just outside the damaged church. They want to kill our bodies, but they cannot kill our souls because our faith is not the faith of uh, killing or the faith of uh, violence. Our faith is the faith of forgiveness. After three hours inside, the bodyguards are nervous. It's getting dark and we've been here too long. The word is out that foreigners are visiting. Foreigners who could be a tempting target for an attack or a high-priced kidnapping. It's just... Um, just the level of persecution is unbelievable to kill innocent people like this in the church and just because they are Christians, just because they don't believe in, in, what, they, in what you believe, if this is justice, if this is and the cover-up from the government. How you can be in a type for four hours and the government does not do anything to protect you? And we see the victims and we see the people heartbroken and nobody cares, nobody cares back home. And just to see the, 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 the blood on the wall and to see their pain, it's just unbelievable. It just breaks my heart, it just breaks my heart. And the West have to wake up. The Canadians, the Americans, their opinions, they have to wake up. We cannot be remaining silent on the corruption of the Iraqi government any longer. Looking for more answers, Majid's delegation meets with Iraqi Deputy Prime Minister Hussein al-Shahristani. He says the Iraqi government had offered security to Christians before the attack. It took an immediate action by informing the church leaders that this could be the case and asked them if they could nominate some of their youth to be part of the Iraqi um, security forces who could be trained quickly and um, equipped to be able to defend those churches. But the response was that, you know, churches do not uh, prefer to have any armed people inside the complex. Later we meet the Sunni vice president, Tariq al-Hashami. I even rushed to the church and tried to reach out myself with humanitarian aids immediately. I reached them before anybody else from, from other church to help those people. Those people consider our brothers. And they are Iraqis at the end of the day. It's my responsibility to protect them. Hashemi warns the Sunni and Christian minorities are under serious threat in Iraq. The Constitution putting all Iraqis in respect of their roots, faith, equal in terms of obligations, in terms of rights. But unfortunately, when you check the practices, you see a difference, you see a deviation from the Constitution. Amid these Iraqi political wrestling matches, the official investigation into the attack on the Baghdad church was inconclusive. And it is that dangerous ambiguity that may explain why so few of the parishioners at this Toronto church are planning to return to Iraq anytime soon. Here, Raja prays for the speedy arrival of her brother, now stranded in Jordan, and for the survival of Christianity in Iraq. It's 2,000 years old, but there are fears it could face extinction. When I saw Ragda hand on the wall, this hand become a symbolic to the pain and the suffer of the Christian community in the Middle East. And I felt this my, part of it my responsibility for not succeeding to protect her or saving her life. I blamed myself, I blamed the people that remain silent every day about these crimes. I see more bloody hands on the wall.